Max, welcome to CGTN. Great to be here. Talking about Trump's and Pompeo's four years of you know anti-China policies, what institutions do or who do you think drove the Trump administration's anti-China campaign in the past four years, which many people believe were frenetic, and which you know in effect constituted a new Cold War, a new Red Scare? I should mention to you that Mike Pompeo and Donald Trump and Matthew Pottinger whipping up a new, instigating a new Cold War. And it fell on fertile soil domestically within the domestic right because unlike Russia, China is a socialist country. And so there is an ideological conflict there that a right-wing ultra-capitalist administration can market to its domestic base. So the new Cold War with China actually served a domestic political option for Trump. But then you have the military intelligence complex, Congress, um, the think tank complex in Washington, which is funded by the arms industry and foreign governments. And you have a wing of the U.S. intelligentsia, which is committed to this new Cold War. Mm -hmm. They actually have skin in the game. They prop when the U.S. has what they call a near peer competitor, uh, a major, a powerful state, which the U.S. needs to contain. Tons of money is pouring into their pockets as a result of the new Cold War with China. And it will continue to do so throughout the administration, which I think will amplify the narrative of humanitarian interventionism focusing on Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and Tibet in order to tug at the heartstrings of suggestible coastal middle class liberals and make them believe that this hostile U.S. Cold War to contain China actually has something to do with saving innocent people from a dictatorial being, whether they want to sacrifice the survival of the world for a mad great power competition that only benefits a small sector of their elite. But right now, unfortunately, reflection is not taking place within either party or their grassroots base. And then talking about America's posture towards, you know, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, the South China Sea, Xinjiang, and Tibet, how much of those policies and, you know, postures do you think were driven by ideals, you know? You know, a, a consistent American value system of liberty and freedom for all. And how much of those policies do you think were driven by American elites' uh, intention on containing the rise of China and keeping American supremacy? First of all, most Americans don't understand China's history, they don't know the history of 100 years of humiliation. They don't understand the history of being colonized. They don't understand the history of being consistently under siege. They don't understand why areas like Tibet, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, and Taiwan are of such strategic importance to China because they don't understand how the United States, the UK, and their allies have tried to use those areas to balkanize China and to encircle it in order to force massive concessions, if not regime change, in Beijing. The U.S. is very threatened by the rise of a socialist party, which is able to produce the largest economy in the world at the commanding heights of its economy and actually present a different model to U.S. monopoly capitalism, or what we would call neoliberalism. And so the U.S. is guided by the cold, hard interests, the same ones guided George Kennan's uh, telegram yeah. calling for the containment of the Soviet Union. But the way that the uh, hybrid war on China is marketed to the U.S. public is in terms of values that different sectors and demographics of the U.S. public can recognize. So to workers in the Rust Belt who support Trump, China's taking your jobs, not the oligarchy decided to ship your jobs away instead of keeping them here. And to progressive middle-class young people on the coasts, it's China is keeping millions of minorities in concentration, and uh, it doesn't like the Dalai Lama, who is this great spiritual healer. No mention of the fact that he was a CIA asset. No understanding of what the role of Tibet has been in 
the that war on China. Then do you think there has been you know double standards when you hear about U.S. politicians' characterization of these quote unquote domestic terrorists versus rioters in other regions such as Hong Kong? Americans need to reflect on the fact that what took place at the U.S. Capitol, which they call a coup, insurrection, treason, a horrendous mob, is what the United States has encouraged in Hong Kong, in across Venezuela, in Nicaragua, in Syria, in Libya, anywhere the U.S. seeks regime change, it weaponizes right-wing fanatics and uses them, trains them, encourages them, cheers them on as they storm parliamentary buildings like they did in Hong Kong and deface the interior of the building, intimidate legislators. I actually tweeted in the middle of this Capitol riot as my hands were basically freezing that it reminded me so much of what I witnessed in Maidan Square in Kiev, Ukraine, with mm -hmm. all of the right-wing people seeking to storm the centers of power. The only thing missing is Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Newton. The cookie lady. Now cookies to the right, handing out cookies to the riot, as she did in Maidan Square, or the Democratic uh, uh, Senator Chris Murphy, a major liberal from Connecticut, actually visiting Maidan Square and standing on stage next to a far-right member of the Social National Party cheering on the rioters. So there's so much hypocrisy here.